Taylor, welcome. I'm so happy to have you on the show. I feel like I've been like stalking your Instagram <laughs> recently. Um, and this episode, you know, I'm just going to come out right with it is really important to me because like I just shared with you, I am 20 weeks along right now. So I'm really excited to dive into, you know, fitness for moms in general, um, and people in general, but also, you know, how that changes when you're pregnant and postpartum. So we will get into it all, but welcome. And I'm so happy to have you here. Thank you so much. And congratulations. I'm like, when I meet a fellow mama tribe member, especially first time around, it's just, it's so exciting and you look incredible. You're glowing. You have the mama glow. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm glad. uh, First trimester, don't know if I was glowing, but now feeling that glow. Um, So I just want to start off with a little bit more about you and just how did you get into the fitness industry and what do you love about it? So it was kind of a natural progression for me. I was actually a professional dancer. I was raised in an extremely athletic family. Um, My dad actually played in the NFL. Um, My brothers were lacrosse players, but I, you know, I had to be a little different because I was the only girl of my family. So my mom put me in dance class and that just took me through life ultimately to a professional career. Um, But from there, I knew that was going to come to a close at some point. So I actually acquired a master's degree in K-12 physical education because I love kids kids and I wanted to teach um, dance in a school system. Life happens and my husband proposed and got a job offer in Portland. So me thinking I could teach anywhere, being adaptable, let's do that. (laughs) Um, But getting out there, the teaching market was very slow. I having the professional dance background, not understanding or realizing that Portland was a huge hub for fitness modeling. I randomly applied to an agency out there didn't hear anything for a few months and they signed me and I was like working for Nike the next week. I couldn't even believe it. So, Oh my God. Anyway, from there, we had to move again across country, constantly starting over. It started to get very frustrating. I think just being a woman who likes to work and enjoys working, loves health and wellness. How could I establish something that I wouldn't constantly have to start from zero? And um, as my husband was building his career. So I ended up winning a nationwide fitness contest with Wilhelmina Models. And my agent there was like, you need two legs to stand on. This is great that you have that master's degree. But if you want to start teaching, if you want to spend long days on set, if you want to have longevity in this business, you have to acquire certifications. So I started with a bar certification and, you know, having the dance background. So I taught, you know, 10 plus classes of bar a week. Then I acquired two nutrition certifications, personal training, and ultimately when I got pregnant, started my pre postnatal corrective exercise specialist cert. So now I just kind of have this well-rounded approach to health and wellness. And I know that was very long-winded, but it's kind of shaped my story and how I approach coaching, not only women, but I think, you know, even my approach to coaching at Barry's <laughs> and beyond, um, kind of all of that comes into play. Yeah, no, I love that. And for anyone that doesn't know, Taylor is due very soon with her (laughs) second child, um, which you cannot tell. Um, And that's actually the great thing about Zoom is, right? It's like- I told you, it's from like, yeah, exactly. From here up, no pregnant, not no pregnancy, but I promise you. But (laughs) I'm, I'm really curious, Taylor, for, you wear so many hats, right? You have your business- you are a mom already of one and now pregnant again, how, you know, when you're not pregnant and when you are pregnant, how do you stay consistent with your workout routine and what would be your best advice for people to stay consistent with it? So the best piece of advice that I ever received, I was 34 weeks pregnant with my first baby and I was on a, on a plane, um, out to California. And she said, I have three babies that are now grown. She goes, if I can tell you one thing, it's live in the stream. It's going to ebb, it's going to flow. But if you can find a way to just be present and and ride that wave, knowing that some weeks are going to be great, you're going to fit in your four plus workouts. Other weeks, you're, you're not going to be able to. But understanding that we don't live in a society that has to be so black and white. It's like meet yourself where you are, I think is the biggest piece of fitness advice that I can give you. You don't feel the same every day. You're, you don't have as much energy <laughs> from day to day. Um, you don't have the, the ability, if you're a working mom, if 
if you are, you know, just entering this new postpartum experience, you know, it's meeting yourself where you are and, and giving your body what it needs in the moment. And it could be an intense, high intense boot camp class, or it could be a simple walk outside. I know for me in postpartum life, it was, it was walks with my son. That was my therapy to get me through the anxiety, to get me to build the confidence of feeling stronger. So I think with consistency, it's not making an unrealistic goal of having to push yourself to the max every single day. Cause that's what social media tells us we should do. I think having consistency is showing up for yourself in a way that feels good for you every day. And if you were say to someone, let's say they have a demanding job plus on top mm-hmm. of it, they're taking care of their family and time is really the issue. And I always say like, it's making the time, right? How are you going to make the time to do it? Do you have any suggestions for people who are just feeling like they have no time to fit in exercise and fitness ways they can? Absolutely. I think there's, it's twofold and don't hate me for saying this, but (laughs) I had to force myself to become a morning person. And I'm talking that five, five 30 AM wake up. That was so difficult to do. And thankfully my husband did it with me. I mean, he's, he's a military guy. So waking up, he's crazy. He wakes up at four 30 every day. I don't, but giving myself that hour, hour and a half in the morning, um, especially for when my son was a little over a year, I found a rhythm. It was like becoming our morning person. You don't have to work out that entire time. Your workout can be 20 minutes. Okay. It can be 30 minutes, whatever you need, but then do something for you before you start to Mm -hmm. pour from that cup for everyone else. And I, I, you can't sugarcoat it. It's like, if you can become a morning person, if you don't have to commute until seven 30, what are you doing for two hours before that? You know, that you could tangibly and realistically utilize that for your own mental health. Um, and then again, going back to that sentiment of 20 minutes, 30 minutes, you can split that up into two 15 minute sessions. There's so many tools that we have literally from the touch of a button now where you can move your body and get a kid foot workout in. And it doesn't have to mean a commute and an hour in the gym. It just doesn't completely. And I think, you know, right now, during, well, you know, hopefully COVID is coming to an end, Yeah, (laughs) but people may not have to commute right now. And so it's a great time just to get in that habit of morning routine. I am a big morning person. I love having my own time in the morning. Mm -hmm. And that's something like, you know, obviously it'll transition once we have our baby, but is that's something I want to keep consistent throughout the rest of my life is having my own time because I need it. I mean, Mm -hmm. and it's so the good thing is if you're not a morning person now, you will love the feeling from it. It will crave you. That will be your motivation to want to keep doing it. Um, so I think that's really important. And the other thing Taylor, that you said that I was just talking about with a client this week is we get so stuck in the fact that we think like, oh, I need to exercise for 30 minutes a day, 60 minutes a day. Mm -hmm but not remembering that we can break it up. I mean, yesterday, actually I did a killer workout. It was a 12 minute, yep, 12 (laughs) minute, um, core and booty workout. And I was dying at the end and it was great because that's all the time I had. And that's all the time. Well, I should say I made as well, but you can, even if it's, you know, walking for 30 minutes a day, do 15 minutes in the morning and then 15 minutes in the afternoon that still equates to her 30 minutes a day. We just, we overthink things. And I feel like build so many things up in our mind. And it's really like getting past those mental blocks. You know? 200%. It's that mindset shift that, because what messages have, have been drilled home to us? Like, I know I grew up in the eighties, you know, nineties yeah. and, and you know, what did we see in front of us all the time? And especially now as like women and moms, it's like the bounce back. It's like, we need to eliminate that dialogue and focus. I always train and I always talk to my clients, move for your energy, like move your energy. If you're feeling stagnant, if you're feeling down, none of our lives are perfect. Just move your body, right? Like sometimes it's throwing on Alexa and dancing around the house, a banshee for 10 minutes that can change your life. And that's still movement. It's still energy. It's still, you know, I think people make it so black or white cut and dry because of what has been driven home to us for decades. Totally. It's more about being 
active and living an active lifestyle. And that means Mm -hmm. like, you know, when you're working all day, not sitting in your chair all day, getting up and moving here and there versus, oh, I need to get in that hit workout today. Yeah. If you get in a 30 minute hit workout versus just focusing on being active throughout the day and, you know, maybe taking the parking further away at the grocery store or walking to your local, um, market instead of driving mm-hmm. there, you are probably actually doing your body <laughs> so much more than doing the stressful hit workout. Um, but it's, we're just, we're so trained now. It's like, am I working out today or am I not working out today Mm -hmm. versus just this let's be active. And that's why I actually do love, I feel like for a while when Apple watches and Fitbit first came out, people were always counting their steps and then it kind of fizzled off and now people are back to it again. And Mm -hmm. I love it because that is, it's such a great way to just see how active you are. Cause usually, which can be frustrating in your workouts, it won't like I find my Apple watch doesn't count my steps in my actual (laughs) workout. So it's like, no, I just need to be active on top of that. Mm -hmm. And obviously there's a time and a place for like straight rest days and you need those. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm curious how I heard you talk about the bounce back and I'm right on track with you. And so one question I have for you that I get a lot with clients is the minute they get that six week clearance of you can work out again, they're like, all right, I'm ready. I want to jump all in. I want to lose this baby weight. What is your best advice for people when they get that clearance? Obviously everyone is different, right? And where they should Mm -hmm. start. If you had also, if you had a C-section or a vaginal birth, et cetera, Mm -hmm. but once they get that clearance, what is the best advice that you can give people also from your own experience? Yeah. I I think, you know, I hear the six week (laughs) number and I cringe, I roll my eyes and I cringe because it's such an arbitrary number. And, you know, unfortunately, I think in our society, we don't do a good job at nurturing the mom after delivery. You get one appointment, you have all these appointments leading up to delivery, you deliver, and then you get one postpartum appointment. And in that appointment, how can you really navigate the waters, especially first time around? Like pregnancy for me, was great. Delivery, incredible water birth experience, like total, I was prepared, right? Postpartum life, I was not prepared for. I I struggled very, very um, deeply with postpartum anxiety. We also had to uproot our family and move across the country. So there were a lot of levels to what was going on with me and I wasn't ready for these, these intense feelings and emotions. So, you know, at six weeks, I think that's the time to analyze and have a conversation with your partner about what you need. It's not the time to say, okay, let's go back to having a normal sex life. It's how do I feel right now about diving back into having a normal sex life? Do I need to seek pelvic floor therapy? Do I need to um, further dive with a lactation specialist because I'm still not sleeping and there's still some issues? Um, and then talking to your OB, if you're having, baby blues are very common, but if, if you, you feel like there's lasting effects, talking to your doctor and potentially just getting screened for postpartum depression, postpartum anxiety, to see if there is something deeper there or if you know this will eventually subside. And then in terms of fitness, it's, okay, how do we relay the foundation? We just housed a human for nine months. (laughs) Our anatomy shifted. You still have the same body that you always had. It's just placed differently. And that's the dialogue shift. It's not, you don't want to get back to a certain place because if we live in the past, you're going to consistently be disappointed, right? So it's like, how do we relay the foundation safely? eliminate some of the impact diastasis recti, which is very common, which is abdominal separation. What impact did we have on our pelvic floor? You know, C-section versus vaginal births are very different. Did you tear? Did you not? Getting an understanding around the magnitude of what you just went through for really the better part of a year, and then taking baby steps to step into a new you, I think is the more important um, mindset and conversation. So I think asking for your help from your OB 
if you can get it, if you have a supportive OB. If not, your mama tribe is right there. <laughs> um, and then I think a pelvic floor specialist, if you can have access to it, I think, you know, I know for myself, it's such a privilege to be able to have access to pelvic floor therapy. I think it should be a part of our postpartum care in general. And then starting basically from ground zero, core connection, I cannot recommend it enough. I mean, literally breathing, connecting to your inner unit, your pelvic floor and doing that for weeks. I'm talking eight to 12 weeks before getting back into, you know, a, a fitness regimen. And then, you know, taking a deep inventory into and a realistic inventory of where you realistically are and building upon that. Yeah, no. And I love, I'm hearing mental health check first. Uh -huh. That's got to be right. Which I also, I have had clients where they want to get back right back into it and they maybe work out for a week and then they're so overwhelmed and they didn't get their mental health right first. Yep. And then they backtrack, which makes them feel worse. And it's just this whole cycle. So I totally hear you on that. And again, I'm taking all this as just advice <laughs> for me after. Um, and then I love that you brought up working with a pelvic floor specialist or doing like, mm -hmm. there's so many, I feel like, and I don't know, Taylor, if you have one, but like a pelvic floor program or something postpartum. I know, um, my sister with her first child did not do any pelvic floor work mm -hmm. during pregnancy and postpartum and now is with her second. And she, her, let's see her son's six months now. So she's been doing it. She did it during pregnancy and after, and she's like mm -hmm. huge difference. So I've actually, huge. I've been working with a pelvic floor physical therapist during my pregnancy. And even just little things of like, you were saying that core connection when I'm doing certain moves, um, and I'm engaging my pelvic floor. And even mm -hmm. as a trainer, like I know these things, but I just wasn't doing it. And now like, you know, I'm like, okay, well, this is like involving someone else now. So I should do it. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> Oh, you will feel it. So you may think like, oh, pelvic floor breathing. That's not going to get my abs back. That's not. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And it's hard. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like dying, dying after my physical therapy mm -hmm. sessions. And when I'm doing them here, my husband's like, are you okay? Because I'm it's panting. That deep shake. Yes. <laughs> I'm like, and if you're working it, it's cold, but it is. And it's like, you have that deep TVA hold. And um, yep. I am actually coming out with a prenatal program here soon. Okay. And which I'm so excited about it, but it's a huge focus on inner unit connection, connecting to the pelvic floor, the transverse abdominis and how that translates into functional fitness. Because especially as your anatomy grows and shifts and trains, and you just said it, like you're a trainer, but this is different, especially as this baby grows, like, and you guys, I got about five pounds of baby in me right now. Like you feel it in other places. And the second time around, you feel it even more. Oh, totally. And it's just like having that support. Like I know in the beginning of my pregnancy, I was having a lot of lower back pain and I could feel, mm -hmm. I could feel things shifting like my hips and things like that. And most women have that natural anterior tilt mm -hmm. and just having, you know, I knew in my head I should be doing, but having someone else to guide you there. I mean, it's like with anything, we know a lot, but we need help and guidance a lot of the time. So I'm actually, I'm hoping Taylor that your program will be out by the time <laughs> I have baby in August, um, because I will definitely be jumping on board, but I'm so glad we brought up. And that's what actually, um, we will be having some other like pelvic floor therapists on just to mm -hmm. talk about it more. I I'm glad that it does seem like it's being discussed more and more because a couple of years ago, I never heard about like, Oh, you'd be taking care of your pelvic floor, you know, no. during pregnancy and, and afterwards. And prolapse is so common. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's unbelievably common, but these are the threads. And Taylor, and can you, can you just explain really quick what prolapse is for anyone that doesn't know? Yeah. So prolapse and I don't know my mom to kill me, but <laughs> she actually had to get surgery uh, this year. So I even learned more about it. Um, yeah. just see that. So basically after you have a baby or multiple babies and, or if you have to go through a hysterectomy postpartum, um, basically the tissues and everything, your bladder, your uterus, and all of the, um, 
things that hold your, the muscles and tissue that hold all of those organs in place start to drop down. So if you're having a feeling of like a golf ball in your vagina and you're feeling heaviness there, that's a sign of prolapse. And now because what happens after your first baby, usually everything becomes a little bit softer, a little bit looser. A lot of people don't go into pelvic floor therapy, get help to restrength and rebuild, a lot of the times you just get pregnant on top of that loose tissue. So what happens, everything starts to drop lower and lower and lower till ultimately you can't hold anything up. And then if you have something like a hysterectomy or you, you have some sort of tissue removal surgery, there's a lot higher of a risk of prolapse. But I have friends that are in their thirties that you know had no idea about it, had no idea how to connect connect to their inner unit and core breathing during their training and are experiencing it at our age. So it's, it's definitely something to consider something to look into, but I think, you know, work, I think what you're doing is exceptionally like proactive <laughs> to be able to work with a specialist during pregnancy and then after, and that's someone who already knows your anatomy and is going to help you, you know, tremendously. Yeah. And for anyone, just so you know, um, like I'm, I'm doing it through my insurance. It's just, it's a mm -hmm. physical there. It's a pelvic floor physical therapist. Mm -hmm. And so if you do, you know, if you're able to have, you know, physical therapy, which I feel like is most part of most people's insurance, mm -hmm. know that you can talk to your doctor, see if it's something that's right for you. Um, I'm hoping to, there will be more and more pelvic floor physical therapists out there, because I think that's actually, that was the toughest part was finding someone available, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it's a great way to, and I'm curious kind of shifting tailored to even when you're not pregnant, are there certain exercises that you think people should focus on, on a daily basis? Core breathing, core connection. Yeah. Every, I mean, everyone is walking around just not connected to their breath. So more importantly, I should, shouldn't just say core connection. Yeah. It's diaphragmatic breath, right? Okay. Getting your breath out of your chest and into your diaphragm and into your core unit. I think, you know, we go to, why do we get so much pain in our lower back and things like that? Cause we're picking things up off the floor that are heavy and we're picking them up or we're sitting at a desk all day, hunched over. Um, you know, we're, we're doing these things over and over and over again with a stagnant core. So you're not working, you're in an inner abdominal unit. And then usually what's happening is you're pulling from other areas of your body, which leads to more discomfort and ultimately injury and imbalances. So I think if you can do anything that you do in your daily life, that might seem tough for you, connect your breath to it connect yeah. your core to it, I think it's just such an important thing to start doing. So diaphragmatic breath is simply breathing from your diaphragm. It's a 360 type of breath that works from your core and that's below the chest. And it makes a huge difference. Like you said, I was having so much sciatic pain earlier on. And then when I started developing this program, I was like, I know I need to do this every day. But again, life, motherhood, toddler, once I did it a week later, my pain was like, it dissipated because the connection was there yeah. and the mind body connection is so important to, to build as well. So, and I'm assuming Taylor, our episode may come out before your program comes out. Mm -hmm. Do you have places like on your Instagram or other places you can refer people just to learn like yeah. how to do, cause I mean, I had to like practice it, to be honest. I didn't just like get it right away. It. I had to mm -hmm. learn the diaph diaphragmatic breathing and really making that connection to my yep. core. Um, so where could people learn more about it? So I actually just did an IGTV on okay, my Instagram. Perfect. So if you go to Taylor Walker fit, there's a full 15 minute core breathing video. I also okay. have a story of all different core breathing, pelvic floor connection, just stories that I've done and how to okay. connect them to functional movement, um, throughout the course of, because I am due so, <laughs> so <laughs> soon of April, depending on when this comes out, I will okay. be doing a core breathing series also on zoom. So if Perfect. you go to my website, you can look on the live workouts and I'm actually going to right after we chat, throw some dates up there. So that okay. I love it. And we'll make perfect. sure to get any, like if there's any links you think would be helpful, mm -hmm. just send them to me and we will get them in the show notes so people can go okay. directly to them. Perfect. Um, but that yep. would be great. Cause I know I definitely had to like work at it. It didn't definitely. come naturally, which I was like, oh geez, I really should have been doing mm -hmm. this for a long time. Like, what months. am I missing? What am I missing out on? It's, it takes two to three. I would say like two to three months to really yeah. get it. 
where you're not thinking about it so much. And that's why I think it's important to try and start while you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. So it's not one more thing postpartum that you have to do on top of it, you know? Right. And then you're not, you know, forcing yourself into one of those girdles. This is your girdle. You have a built-in girdle to help you get everything back in place. Um, So transitioning a little bit just from solely fitness, what are your non-negotiables to stay healthy as a mom? Like your daily non-negotiables. I actually, I talk about these often. They're like, they're four. They're (laughs) pretty much free if you want them to be, uh, which is perfect. It's fitness. And I think moving in a way that feels good. Like I said earlier today, it's like one day it'll be a bar workout. One day I'll be going to kicking my own butt at berries and, you know, hopping in a class and throwing around some weights. Um, The other days it might just be for breathing, stretching and a walk around the neighborhood with my son. Uh, Nutrition. I think adjusting that mindset, I'm a former fast food junkie. I share this all the time. I'm Italian. I'm made up of many, many different cultures. So food is just what I love, but I had to shift my focus into food as fuel and food as energy versus food for strictly as satiety. But I enjoy all foods. I'm not on a certain strict diet. I just have a whole foods approach to living, but that also took time. And I'm talking years to, to know what works and what doesn't work for me. Um, and then breath work and then finally stress management. Um, I think women moms in 2021, especially in 2020, finding ways to deal with stress that are healthy, but boundary setting just becomes so important and something that I have had a really hard time doing for a long time. And even up to uh, very recently, you know, being able to say, I'm doing too much. (laughs) Yeah. Where can we dial back and being okay with just being, I think in our society, we, we are told that we constantly have to be doing everything and keep 12 balls in the air to feel successful or be successful. But at the end of the day, what does that ultimately lead to burnout, lack of joy, right? Yeah. So um, just really finding good ways to deal with stress. So fitness, nutrition, breath work, stress management. I love that. Negotiables. And I'm curious, Taylor, and I was actually, I'm, I'm glad I remembered because I was going to ask it earlier being, you know, a fitness instructor, fitness mm-hmm. model. Did you deal with any feelings postpartum especially, you know, when that six week mark hit, or you finally had approval Mm -hmm. to work out again, did you deal with, like, I can only imagine, I feel like I would feel more pressure. I mean, even I already think I do just being a trainer, Mm -hmm. being a dietitian, I'm like, you know, am I going to get my body back quickly? Mm -hmm. If I don't, are people going to judge me? How did you make it through that? Or did you have feelings like that? I, of course I did. I think I'm a woman in today's society, you know, and, and again, it's, it's what I want to, to continue to do is shift that discussion of what the bounce back looks like and put mental health on the forefront of once your mental health is in check, the physicality and the feelings of, um, you know, feeling less than or feeling uncomfortable of your skin are, are mitigated. They're, they're small in comparison to what the mental health struggle of motherhood can bring. And for me, genetics plays such a huge role in not only the amount of our bodies in general, and yeah. people don't realize, and you know, this as a trainer, 90% of your genetic makeup determines what your physicality is. So, you know, I have friends that are in great shape, but no matter how they eat, when they get pregnant, they gain 50 pounds. It's just yeah. how it is. And, you know, thankfully for, for someone like me in this space, I genetically, my parents are both, you know, muscular, small, and, but you you leave the hospital and you still look six months pregnant. (laughs) And I remember my brother coming to see me and he didn't do anything. This is nothing. My brother is incredible, by the way, but he like just rubbed my belly and I lost it lost like I it was just like kind of that like tipping point a Mm -hmm. little bit in my like postpartum existence I had so many visitors last time and I didn't set any boundaries and he rubbed my belly and I like went in my room and cried my eyes out because I was you just want to feel like yourself especially as a mom so much is out of your control um but 
the transition, and, and I know I'm getting long winded here, yeah. was really when I came to terms with I wasn't happy. And my mom, I was face, I remember FaceTiming with her and she's like, Taylor, I think, I think you're struggling with depression. She's like, yeah, everyone's been there at some point, but she was like, I think you need to go talk to someone. And I knew it. Like I would have these feelings of like shaking and I, I wasn't enjoying being a new mom. And I was like, I, I love everything leading up to this point. I just rocked pushing a human out of my, you know, where, and I was like, why am I not feeling like a rock star. Yeah. And instead I'm having these insecure feelings and all, which every mom feels. And, you know, although they weren't super associated to body image, which I think every woman will struggle with at some point, because you just want to feel like yourself. But the second I shifted that focus from the physicality of it to the mental aspects of it, again, everything else shrank. I sat down and I share this often because there's been two points in my life where I've sat down and literally pen to paper. Okay, what is my tangible happiness plan? What do I wanna feel like a year from now? And then from there, what can I do to help me get there? So step one was go talk to a doctor. Step two was download the peanut app, join a mom group or whatever. And especially after coming out of this year, step number three was asking for help. Step number, you know, and so on yeah. and so forth. But it was like that recognition of, I can't do everything. I'm going to live in this space feeling sorry for myself, or I can say, what is going to make me happy and figure it out. And that's what I did. And I didn't have hard conversations with my spouse that I should have. I, I tried to do everything and I hit a wall. Um, so of course there's pressure on the physicality. I think every woman feels like that because you, you know, we're also having babies later in life, which makes yeah. it harder on our bodies mm-hmm. and then being in the fitness yeah. industry and then, and then, and then, and then, but, uh, to anyone out there listening, watching it's mental health first. Yeah. And, and, you know, I'm sure too, Taylor, and we, we actually, we talk about it a lot on our podcast is, <sighs> if your stress is increased, which your stress is increased with Mm -hmm. any type of negative thoughts or not feeling like yourself or, um, you know, feeling mood disturbances or depression, you're, it's going to prevent you from hitting those goals anyways, because Mm -hmm. there are so many other factors that play your hormones are off. Um, you're more likely to retain weight or gain weight, things like that. So for anyone listening to that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I have to like feel good mentally first and then I'll mm-hmm. get into it. But they're like, I'm really just going to get into it. No, no, no. In order for the physical parts to come and for you to reach those goals, your mental health, which also plays a huge role in your sleep, mm-hmm. which plays a ginormous role in you actually reaching those goals, your sleep and stress come first and then everything else. And those are all tied. Both of them are tied to your mood and how you're feeling. And you have to start listening to yourself and honoring that. So I love, I thank you just for sharing that and giving people those tips because I mean, and for myself included, (laughs) that's why I'm just so excited for this episode selfishly. And it's Um, it's easier. It's honestly, it's easier said than done. Yes. But I think the more vulnerable that we can be as women and moms, the more, you know, we're not living in the, you know, era of our moms where it was like, they just loved being moms 24 seven. And it was great. You know, I think it's so powerful that we can now share these stories and be like, we're in the trenches together and this is what worked. This is what didn't work. And, and say, I was right there with you, you know, regardless of what you might've seen on social media. And even having, you know, one of our goals too, is to really eliminate the stigma behind going to therapy and seeing Mm -hmm. a therapist. So I think one of the things that I know I will be having my therapist on, like, you need to be on call Mm -hmm. after I give birth Yep. whenever I need you. And, you know, even if you're not seeing a therapist now, maybe consider that as part of your postpartum plan, find someone. Cause actually I will say that takes the longest time is finding Mm -hmm. the right person. Yes. And you know, if you're using insurance, who's covered by your insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but to me, that should be also part of that postpartum plan is having yes. a therapist because your doctor, if you have support from your doctor, that is great. But also some doctors 
may not be as supportive. It's a spectrum. Yeah. It's a whole spectrum. And, um, just having, again, that guidance for someone to push you to say, okay, let's get into your thoughts, realize what's Mm -hmm. happening and they'll help you come up with that action plan. Cause that's what we need. We can be in our thoughts, know what to do, but we need to take action. I think that is such an incredible piece of advice because it's like, what do we focus on right now? It's like the nursery and what we're packing for the hospital, but rarely is it, how do we package postpartum life in a, in a different way? Exactly. What's the plan for your mind and for your pelvic floor? Like it's necessary. Yeah. No, I love this all Taylor. And I'm curious now, I know we, we mentioned your program coming out, but where can people connect with you, learn more if they're interested in taking your program, you know, whatever details you can give us um, right now. Great. So I run um, a lot through my social media. So you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, um, Facebook at Taylor Walker fit. From there, I run a blog, taylorwalkerfit.com. So that's everything kind of included, motherhood, lifestyle, fitness, wellness, live workouts. Um, But very excitingly, and hopefully around Mother's Day, my prenatal program will launch on the Jillian Michaels, the fitness app. So basically what it is, is a four-week program that will help connect you to your inner unit. It'll teach you how to get into core breathing, how to connect your core breathing and pelvic floor to functional movement. Um, There's also 10 workouts and labor training as well. So it's really exciting and it's hopefully a program that will teach pregnant women to feel empowered to move their bodies. And what I mean by that is, is understand how to modify, understand how to connect that core breath. And then if you want to do any other workout in the app or beyond, you know how to modify because it's yeah. so difficult and intimidating to walk into a class where a lot of the trainers aren't versed on how to, other than the basics yeah. on how to adequately coach pregnant women. Um, and what does that lead to if they don't? Pelvic floor issues, ab separation, among other things. So it's kind of taking your control into your own hands. So I'm super, super excited about it. Um, and yeah, I just, I can't wait for that to launch. And I'll, of course, I'll announce all of that on my social media and my blog as well. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I'm so happy you're going to have the birthing training too. And it'll yes. be out in May. So I'll be able yes. to take it before. So again, <laughs> selfishly, so great for me. Um, but I do have Taylor, we like to end every episode with a little rapid fire Q and a. So first thing mm-hmm. that comes to mind, all right. um, well, and this goes perfectly with what we're talking about, but what is your favorite de-stressing practice or tool? Can I say working out? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And if you have a specific, like get specific with it. Like, is there a specific type of exercise that really, I, I mean, I just like to grab some weights, some, yeah, some dumbbells. I like to grab some, dumbbells, some strength training, put, uh, yeah, some strength training, throw on music. I want the music loud and like, I want to go back to the Jersey shore. I want to like smack some tables and I want to like <laughs> dig deep for 20 minutes or so. And that's, I'm good. Oh my gosh. I love it. Okay. Next one. Coffee or tea? Coffee. All right. Do you put anything in your coffee or just plain? Oat oh, milk cappuccino. I get my one a day. It's love glorious. It. <laughs> love it. Love it. And then my favorite question, what is your favorite home cooked meal? Oh my gosh. Oh, rapid fire. Okay. Home cooked <laughs> meal. Oh, it has to be my husband's filet. Oh, so like good. Or does he have certain, pasta. does he have certain sides with the filet that like make it or he's from the Midwest. So anything with like <laughs> extra cheddar cheese is like, like, but he makes a loaded baked potato. And oh, it's, it's that's what glorious. I was just thinking when you said yeah. cheddar cheese, <laughs> it is. I'm sorry to do that to you. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh, what are we, what are we having tonight? <laughs> yeah. But I'm like all in all in. Oh, that That's sounds the gift of wonderful. quarantine. He's become, he's become a chef. It's glorious. Oh, that's so nice. Well, Tara, thanks so much for being on. And also congratulations because you're having your baby girls so soon. Yeah. Um, and and I can't too. wait to follow along. I know. Yeah, I, I'm definitely a little bit behind, but no, I'm, I'm really excited. And this has just been such a great episode for myself, but I know for all of our listeners and just again, bringing awareness to what we should be focusing on 
that can really help us as women during this time. Um, and two, from any men listening out there, if your wives aren't listening or your partners aren't listening, um, it can still be valuable for you too. So thank you again. And um, we'll be looking to see your baby girl soon. Awesome. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm just, I, I'm ecstatic anytime we can have this normalized mamahood conversation. So I appreciate it. Mm-hmm.